welcome everybody today to uh, our session, the uh, next session for the Maryland Planning Commissioners uh, Association Conference. Thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate it. Uh, this session is related to the water resource element and guidance update. Uh, best practices for integrating climate change and identifying suitable receiving waters. And so, um, two speakers. Uh, Matt, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good. Good. I guess we're still morning, right? Good morning, everyone. Matt Rowe, I'm the assistant director at uh, Maryland Department of Environment and Water and Science Administration. Um, so I do a lot with like Chesapeake Bay, TMDL, uh, implementation, climate work, we're building, trying to build climate adaptations into all of our water um, programs and permits. Um, so happy to be here today to present and work with planning on uh, the most recent update to the guidance. Thank you. I'm Jason Dubo. I manage our resource conservation management unit at Maryland Department of Planning um, in our office in Baltimore. And uh, I manage a variety of long-term type of environmental planning issues, some related to land preservation, some related to water resources, some related to climate change adaptation, uh, some related to forest uh, resource planning. So it's just a variety of things related to that. And um, yeah, so uh, we're, we're happy to have a chance to kind of give you information about this brand new update. We'll talk about the impetus for that a little bit too um, today. So yeah, we're going to tag team. Jason's going to start, and I'll I'll. Uh, Wrap up. <laughs> Can you all hear us okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so, so yeah, and as I know some people here are local government staff planners. I'm sure obviously a lot of you are planning commissioners. And thank you for your volunteer work. Um, I worked for just three years in Worcester County, Maryland, but um, I, I do uh, appreciate um, all the hard work necessary for planning commissioners to be prepared for and to direct staff as well and to prepare for comp plan updates and to review um, all the types of different things you all have to do, review for the for the counties and municipalities. Um, so this very first slide has to do with the water resource element. Now some of you uh, may not know what the water resource element is. I, I just want to show of hands to, would you all let me know if you've heard of the water resource element before? So actually probably about half of you all, okay. For the folks who haven't known about what the water resource element is, it's one of the mandated chapters of a local comprehensive plan. Um, it's mandated for all municipalities and counties with planning and zoning authority. Um, so the, the purpose of the water resource element is um, to do two things, um, most specifically. It's really, to, in, in a really broad sense, to make sure that your land use plan and your comprehensive plan can actually be supported by the, the water resources and water resource infrastructure that you have. So the very first part is um, drinking water um, and other water resources, making sure that you have adequate amounts of that, not only to serve your existing population, but also for future development, whether it's residential, um, industrial, commercial, institutional, making sure you have enough for the future development proposed in your land use plans. And the second part has to do with um, what is called suitable receiving waters. Um, when we really think about this as really any kind of streams, creeks, or rivers that you're adjacent to, any watersheds that you're within, that you're draining to, um, making sure that, in this case, those, those receiving waters can support the amount of um, stormwater and wastewater um, needs and, and discharges that are happening from both your existing development and, again, your future development happening and envisioned in your local land use plan. Um, this is a slide about what's new. So, um, and I should provide for background, that chapter became a required element about, um, I would say maybe 15 years ago. Um, so um, local governments were actually uh, mandated to create this water resource element chapter um, by a certain deadline. I think it may have been 2010, um, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so that was a, a now about a decade ago. And um, what's changed, um, for example, is that, um, and, I, and I, I think, Matt, you'll probably get into this a, a bit, uh, but there's been some changes that, that um, over the last decade, for example, um, and so now it's important to do a couple things. Um, now that Maryland Department of Environment has uh, new ways of, of managing its water resources programs over the last decade, things like the Bay TMDL have happened. And um, now, of course, we have more awareness of climate change impacts, both along the coast as well as inland. Um, the idea now is to think about how do we make sure to um, meet these new expectations 
um, that are, are happening. Um, one important thing here is that we have, we talk about best practices. Um, the guidance here is not mandated, um, but the agencies, um, MDE and, and partner planning, believe that the best practices in this guidance um, will help you as a local government achieve the requirements of the water resource element. So now that we recognize that climate change is happening and that there's new ways of, of ensuring that you're protecting your water resources as you grow, um, these best practices can get you there to prepare. Um, also in this slide we talk about checklists. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible to complete the water resource element. So we have checklists. These are all links um, that um, periodic, periodically during our presentation we'll, we'll bring some of these up. The checklist will show you the most important aspects to um, integrate into your water resource element chapter. Um, so let's see, then lastly of course is web-based. Um, so as we all experience, we, we sometimes do like to have a document to, to read through to help us, um, but in this case we have, this is web-based, and so it makes it a lot easier to link to all the online resources that are out there um, that can really help you to access data related to water, sewer and storm water, also help you access climate change related information, whether it's current problems from climate change or projected impacts from climate change. So that's why we've made a web base. It makes it a lot easier to update over time too. Are, are you sending these slides around? I think that they're gonna, slide, they're gonna send the presentations afterwards. So it will have all these links in there. Um, and so this is a little bit more background about the water resource element and its requirements. I talked a little bit about the, the um, aspects at the very beginning, um, but what stayed the same is that for, for folks here who are familiar with the water resource element, the drinking water assessment and wastewater assessment guidelines of, the, of our previous guides from 2007, which are still online um, at these links, um, just are still current and should be followed. Um, and, and this is really two of the most basic aspects of, of your work. Um, like I said before, making sure you have actually enough water capacity. And this expands it to thinking about, do you have enough wastewater capacity as well to support your local land use plan? Um, and a part of this is gonna be talking to your staff and, and your planning uh, staff, making sure that they provide you the information you need to answer <coughs> those questions. Um, whether it's your, your public facilities folks or your environmental planning staff, um, you know, there, are, there always will be somebody at your local level who knows um, how much capacity has been allocated from your water and wastewater systems, um, will know how much flow and demand is currently happening for those systems, and it'll give you a sense of really how much more residential, non-residential, industrial, institutional growth you can accommodate or not. Um, sometimes um, this can be a severe restriction. Um, you may not have as much capacity as you want. Um, in order to serve the future growth that you envision. Um, so as a result, um, sometimes you have to put forward new ideas. You may have to talk to folks like, like folks in Matt's shop for uh, asking for additional drinking water allocations from either your groundwater to make use of that or uh, adjacent um, streams or rivers um, or reservoirs for that matter. <coughs> so that's just one of the most basic aspects of the water resource element to be thinking about and your staff um, should be readily able to provide you this information. Um, this slide talks about our expectations. Um, now given that we have added new information and requests in this guidance, um, there is this understanding that um, um, these are best practices and we, we, we ask the governments to follow these, these checklists that I talk about um, as, as well as you can um, but similar to, to other types of work, other types of planning, whether it's park planning, recreation planning, or transportation planning, for water resource planning, you often have to do um, data compilation, analysis, or studies first to figure out what's necessary. So for example, if your staff tell you that um, you may not have much capacity left in your, in your drinking water system or your wastewater system, um, there may need to be studies done to figure out, well, what options do we have to get additional capacity? Um, what if we connect um, several septic systems that are uh, adjacent to our, 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 local, our, our municipality? Uh, will that give us additional wastewater capacity under our permit for, or not? Um, so studies sometimes need to happen um, before you um, can inform your water resource element, just like other types of planning as well. Um, 
So and that includes things related to climate change, which is really, we've all heard about it, but it's still a brand new subject in many ways and understanding what those climate change impacts are to your particular local jurisdiction, um, you know, whether you're on the coast or whether you're inland. So whether those impacts are things just as basic as increased heat or potential for drought um, or increased precipitation intensity, um, those are the things to start collecting information from. Um, again, MDE has a lot of that information. The Department of Natural Resources does too. And in our department, we can connect you, uh, whether through our regional planners or others, connect you to resources that are out there um, to start doing this type of, of work. But we recognize in this second bullet, um, you know, if we recognize that financial resources or staff are not available, at the least start identifying what those gaps are in your information, um, what the data needs are, so that you can, between now and your subsequent conference plan update, start making plans to try to fill those gaps. I talked about this a little bit already, technical assistance providers. Um, the Water and Science Administration um, that, that Matt um, leads with, with, with Lee Curry, um, the unit um, that, that I lead, but also all of our regional planners and our local assistance and training, um, Chesapeake and Coastal Service, and also don't forget there's also the Maryland Geological Survey um, who, gives, who has lots of uh, information about your groundwater resources as well as your uh, surface water resources as, uh, too. Um, they will also tell you if you live north of the coast um, what you need to know about sea level rise and uh, saltwater intrusion as the sea level rises, um, if, depending on what types of groundwater aquifers you're using. Um, other folks out there, Department of Agriculture, um, soil conservation districts, watershed groups, and others can help with this too, but um, we would be the ones uh, to help connect you if you needed that help. Um, they may be able to help you with data compilation or, or just brainstorming ideas for helping to meet some of your needs. So the next two slides talk about when to update your water resource element. Um, so as background, like I said, um, back in 2010 or so, um, a lot of local governments um, created the water resource element and um, it was very comprehensive. Um, but it's, it, is a, it is not an easy push up to complete your water resource element. So over time, as local governments um, created brand new land use plans or even small adjustments to them, they may not have updated their water resource element as well. Um, so one of the important things here is to be thinking about um, when do I have to update my water resource element? Um, one of the most important things to be thinking about um, on the next slide actually is if your land use plan is, is changing dramatically or your vision for density is changing dramatically, um, that means that your water and sewer demand might also change dramatically. Or if you have um, new areas for industrial uh, use that uh, are gonna be served by your public system, again, that can increase your demand. Um, so think about your land use plan, uh, talk about it to your staff. They, there is a way, um, MDE again has resources for translating uh, square footage of industrial areas, commercial areas, um, how large your restaurants are, how many seats are available, depending on what your vision is, how many homes, whether they're townhomes or not, you can translate that into increased demand for water and sewer. That's okay, so you can ask your staff, you can ask um, all the state agencies, how can I help translate my vision for land use um, into new amounts of demand on our, on our water and sewer infrastructure? Um, so that's one of the questions here about when do you need to update your water resource element? Well, this slide in particular talks about the issue of climate change and flooding. So this particular guidance update is focusing a lot more on climate change issues and flooding. Um, as we've seen in Maryland, unfortunately, flooding is a risk both uh, coastal and inland. Um, and so one of the things we're trying to stress more here is, is thinking about your land use plan um, and your water resource element. Have you identified um, any kind of flood prone areas, okay? Um, have you um, considered flood risks? Um, climate change, for example, is changing the floodplains in some areas. Um, and um, the, the thing to be thinking about there is if you're planning new development, for example, are you planning that new development in an area that's flood prone? Or is that new development potentially gonna contribute to flood issues elsewhere in your jurisdiction, for example? So thinking about that, um, your water resource element should 
ideally you consider those types of issues so it informs what your land use plan looks like. Um, also, we have here is just, you know, have you considered impacts of climate change to water resources at all? Uh, we, we understand that most water resource elements have not done that at this point. Um, but again, like we said, if you, if you can consider those, update your water resource element, at the least to identify what the data gaps are and ways to move forward to figure out what are the climate change impacts going to be, not only to your water resources, but also your infrastructure for water and sewer and stormwater, um, to flooding, um, to your communities, to natural resources as well. Um, secondly, we're thinking about those receiving waters I talked about earlier. There's really two major classifications. I'm probably oversimplifying this, and Matt will, will um, clarify this, but we have these impaired water bodies in a jurisdiction sometimes that have TMDLs. Um, other times we have high quality water bodies um, that are the very best rivers or streams or creeks in the state and there's special requirements related to those as well. Um, the state is constantly updating information about those particular receiving waters. So the receiving water in your jurisdiction may have actually gotten better over time in terms of its water quality and living resources, the fish that live in there, the shellfish that live in there, um, or it may have gotten worse. So getting that information is important, again, for planning your types of land use development. And if you wanted additional types of um, uh, requirements to ensure that that development is as protected as possible of your water bodies. And um, the last bullet um, has to do, again, I stressed a little earlier is that if your water and sewer demand is really inching up there, um, MD has this threshold of 80%. Um, it's something that um, is, is especially important as a threshold um, for figuring out if you are kind of um, at the tail end of your available capacity for sewer and, and, and drinking water to support your future development. And, and um, so I'll hand this off to Matt now. And Matt, I'm not sure if you want to say more about this current approach about the threshold and wastewater permitting or not. Sure, but, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, right, I don't know if you all are familiar, back in, um, I guess it was around 99, 2000, we had some pretty severe droughts in Maryland. Um, there was a commission that was formed, the Woolman Commission. Um, I think Woolman was a, uh, like a model or a hydrogeologist from Hopkins, very famous guy who like led this commission and um, to study, you know, how, how do we make sure our water resources are sustainable into the future? And that's where this, uh, this capacity management planning idea started to, um, you know, the department picked it up. We started to incorporate that into some of our permits. So um, it's not only on the water supply end. So if you're at like 80% of your, you know, starting to exceed 80% of your uh, water allocation, you know, for drinking water, you know, that that's, um, sort of a, a, a threshold or a good indication where you might want to revisit, you know, your, your source water to make sure you have enough um, capacity, like Jason was talking about earlier, to support plan growth and development. So that's 80, that 80% 80 threshold is we use it in both our uh, uh, water, our source water permits, I believe, as well as in, in wastewater, if on your wastewater, um, in your wastewater treatment plants, if you're starting to exceed 80% of your design capacity, we also look at that as a threshold where you might need to kind of step back and do some additional planning to make sure you're not, um, you know, exceeding your wastewater treatment plant capacity with um, growth. So that's in some of our permits right now, kind of as a planning threshold to really think about as you, you know, prepare your water resources element. Also, we're, we're starting, and I, I mentioned earlier, um, I'm involved with looking at all our water programs and where we can build climate adaptations into those. So in, in addition to um, that 80% of your design capacity or, allo or your allocation, we're also looking at, in, at wastewater, if you're having peak flows, um, there's also what your wastewater treatment plants are designed to um, assimilate certain peaking factors. You know, you get peaks in when everyone you know, comes home after work and is flushing their toilet, right? Um, you get peaks or you get pulses of, um, uh, wastewater coming through the system that you you know you need to have the capacity to deal with so we're starting now to also as uh, permits come up for renewal for wastewater treatment plants we're looking at that peaking factor as well and if you're exceeding that uh, the design peaking factor for your plant that can be an indication of um, 
rain, you know, rain events, if you have like a leaky wastewater system during rain events, you can get infiltration and inflow into your systems that kind of spike those peaking factors as well. So those are some of the things we're starting to build into permits and that you can also think about if you're, again, if you're planning growth on a system that's starting to exceed these capacity levels, you know, that's something you want to be thinking about, you know, how am I going to manage capacity with plan growth and development? Do I need to expand systems? You know, what options do I have? And those are some things you can think about as you um, pre prepare your water resources element, kind of where you are with your uh, both drinking water and wastewater capacity. Um, so this is kind of a lot here uh, to digest, but as Jason mentioned earlier, really the two, two big reasons we wanted to update the guidance was A, as, as Jason mentioned earlier, we're now under, as of 2010, we were in, under a Bay TMDL. So we're, we went from a, a voluntary approach to Chesapeake Bay restoration to a regulatory approach under the Federal Clean Water Act. So that was a change in 2010 that pretty much applied statewide because pretty much every county drains to the bay. Um, so that was one big reason. And, and this is really, I'm, I'm gonna briefly touch on the Clean Water Act framework, um, but this, that's the intention of this slide to, to, to um, kind of explain in, in, a, in a graphical way the, um, the regulatory framework you know, that, we're, that we're using now for our water resource management by and large. And then also, as Jason mentioned, um, climate change. Uh, actually, in the statute, there's a statute that created the Maryland Cl uh, Commission on Climate Change, and in that statute, it actually it actually requires state agencies to consider climate in their planning, you know, regulations, and basically everything they do. So we have actually have a statutory charge to start to build climate adaptation, consider sea level rise, you know, the climate related impacts that we're seeing um, in all of our, um, in, in all that we do in the state agencies. So we wanted to make sure that climate considerations were you know, brought into this guidance update as well because we have a statutory charge to do that. Um, but with this slide, does this pointer work? Yeah, I, I probably don't want to get into too much of this, but what, what we try to do in the water resources element is really explain you know, what, is, what is the water resources management framework so you can understand kind of how the regulatory process works and that can inform your planning update. Um, and just briefly, what I'll say is it all starts, this box up here is sort of the, the top of the flow chart, and it all starts with water quality standards. So um, under the Clean Water Act, we're, um, we were required, jurisdictions were required to develop standards for all their water bodies. So an example might be if, um, you know, we have cold water streams that support trout. So that's, that's a designated use of water quality standard and there's specific, so for trout designated waters, there's specific temperature requirements that are supposed to be met. We have shellfish harvesting waters that have um, bacteria, um, criteria that need to be met to protect shellfish resources, you know, and, and public health with human consumption. So all of the water bodies throughout the state have standards, whether it's, you know, it's temperature, dissolved oxygen, a pH, a number of water quality standards are supposed to meet. So that's sort of the foundation of, of the regulatory framework. You set the stand, the standards are set for the waters. We monitor those. So these yellow boxes here really talk about kind of like how we monitor and assess our waters throughout the state. We work very closely with the Department of Natural Resources to do that, to, to determine whether those standards are being met. And then if they're not, if they're, they're impaired, they go on the impaired waters list, and then we have to develop a TMDL, which some of you are familiar with. Again, we're under a bay-wide TMDL now. So that's this kind of, the side of the flow chart here sort of uh, indicates that impaired waters process. Um, but also, as Jason mentioned earlier, in some cases, we have higher water quality um, in areas where we're actually exceeding, we have better water quality than is required under the standards. And in those cases, we want to protect either, you know, the existing water quality that's um, being attained or even higher water quality that's, you know, better than the standards that are required. And, you know, through, in, in, at MDE, we use our permits, you know, um, we use permits to address point sources, but we also have non-point source programs that we put in place to, to help restore waters as well as help um, protect higher water. So really this just kind of lays out that, that sort of framework there. And there's also a process too 
and we, we haven't really done that in Maryland. Um, but if you um, if you think say say you know there's a watershed that's impaired and it's it's fully built out, you don't you don't um, you don't think it's realistic or achievable to at obtain those water quality standards. Um, there is a process whereby you can sort of downgrade and change the standards with water. We haven't done that in Maryland. We're still, I don't even know if we've, um, I think we're developing like a standard operating procedure for that or the process by which you'd um, go about doing that. But um, all that to say that, you know, there is a process by which if standards are unattainable, you know, you can reevaluate those. So that's what that box over there is. Um, but anyway, that's just a quick snapshot of kind of, you know, the, at a high level of, of the regulatory framework, you know, and the regulatory framework comes into play with our permits and approvals. Um, so this, this slide really just covers all those boxes um, that I just talked about. And, and again, as Jason mentioned, each of these are hyperlinked. So when you get the presentation, um, you can click into each of these areas, you know, get a description, links to resources of where you can find out where your water quality standards are, where you can find out the, the status of your waters. Are they, you know, is the water quality improving, degrading? You know, is it under a TMDL or a high quality water? So um, we provide all the information on the web to really kind of guide you through that so you understand the condition of your water resources, you know, uh, wh where they are as you plan your growth and development that'll hopefully inform, you know, you can have a, um, uh, an interplay between, you know, growth and, and making sure you protect your water resources. I mentioned the use attainability analysis, but then also we have a, a, a little bit, and this is not part of the, the regulatory framework per se, but we talk a little bit as well about, you know, flooding and, and considering if, if you're planning growth and uh, development in an area that you're already experiencing, maybe some local flooding, um, or maybe it's in a flood, there's growth and development in the floodplain or existing communities in the floodplain. Um, we provide some guidance in the document as well about, um, you, know, have, you know, different considerations you might want to think about if you're planning growth and development in flood prone areas so you're not really exacerbating um, those local flooding conditions. So there's some resources there. Um, and again, all the blue, again, hyperlinked uh, to, to these areas of the the guidance. Um, we also provide best practices in terms of um, um, the sensitive areas element too. So there's an interplay, like if you have, um, you know, high quality wetlands or you know sensitive resources. I, th I think those types of things, Jason can probably speak better to it, are covered in the, in the sensitive areas element of your plan. Um, there can obviously be an interplay between that and your water resources element. So like protecting important wet wetland areas that can assimilate floodwaters, maybe in, in some of your flood prone watersheds, that might be an area where you have, um, you can align your sensitive areas element of your plan with your water resources element. So we, we provide some language in the guidance to um, help you with that. Uh, we also talk about best practices and uh, for assessing your water hazard risks, like risk to infrastructure or, you know, if you're planning growth and development in an area, you know, you want to think about if there's a, if it's in a coastal area and, you know, we get, we get a hurricane that comes through or, you know, a hurricane with extreme precipitation, will you have, um, you know, will your road network be jeopardized? Where will people in those communities be able to get to their emergency services? Will it, you know, how, how, how will that maybe impact, um, you know, drinking water sources or, um, Again, your you know your um, your wastewater treatment systems. So think about you know like what kind of hazards to your water infrastructure you know might be might um, areas be vulnerable to that you're planning growth and development. We provide some guidance in those areas and and how you can account um, account for uh, climate change adaptation in different parts of your WRE analysis. Also, it's important to think about um, maybe your local comprehensive. Uh, excuse me, your um, what is it under FEMA? It's your, your local, your hazard mitigation plan. Um, there's an interplay between hazard mitigation planning, obviously, that you might want to think about. So, you know, um, think about your hazard mitigation plan, you know, consult that as you update your WRE and where there might be ways to align the two. There's a lot of good, um, you know, there, local governments have done a lot of good like hazard and vulnerability analysis, threat analysis in those local hazard mitigation plans. Um, so think about where, you know, opportunities to align those. 
Um, and we provide other examples of climate change risk, you know, things that, that you might want to think about as you're updating your plan with respect to climate. All other tools and data analysis and, and different strategy approaches are also in the guidance. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll say too, we realize that this is a guidance document. This is just going to reiterate something that Jason said. Um, and we understand that, you know, we're in state government too. We understand there's resource constraints, you know, you're, well, you're different um, governments are in different places with respect to the resources and, 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 and how deep you can dive into your water resources element update. So we understand there's gonna be a spectrum of, of sort of capacity to update your WRE, but kind of at bottom line, and, and we have, as Jason mentioned, tools and checklists that you can use and try, and try to hit all those. But at the bottom line, if you, know, you haven't discussed climate or considered climate at all, and pass comp plans, you know, we want to see some discussion of that, you know, some consideration of that, whether it's studies, like Jason said, you know, whether there's gaps and, and you don't really know and there's some study needs really that are necessary before you really have a good handle on what climate change impacts might be. But, you know, just some speaking to um, changing conditions and how you're considering that within your planning process. Um, again, understand there might be a spectrum of that where you're just really Certain, again, certain governments have more capacity to really go into details than others. Um, but some acknowledgement and discussion of it at minimum is um, what we're hoping to see. And we've also, uh, I think Myersville, we're starting to review, Jason mentioned, in Aberdeen. Um, so, you know, as you're developing your plan, come to us. Jason talked about, you know, being able to provide technical resources. We're already starting to review comp plans, draft plans, and give input. So, you know, please, if you're struggling, reach out and we'll see where we can help you. Um, we also within, and this is, I think this is something we're all kind of, um, we recognize the importance, but we're kind of grappling with how do we, you know, bring equity considerations into our work. So there is a, a, a part in the uh, WRE, up, uh, in, the, in the guidance, where we encourage you to think about equity. Um, we, there's not a lot there. Again, we're still um, trying to, um, we're still evolving and adapting in terms of um, and maturing in our thinking of how you know how we bring equity into into everything we do internally within the department. But we wanted to take the opportunity too to encourage folks to think about that as you develop your plan. So we have some guidance in there. So you know if you're planning if you, if you have new development next to an underserved community, you know what what challenges and opportunities does that create? You know think about that. Just take the opportunity maybe to think about that um, in your planning. You don't want to exacerbate like you know maybe drinking water quality issues if there's lead service lines in um, in a neighboring community and you're 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 hooking into that system um, you you, you want to make sure that you're not um, you know causing any additional problems to disadvantage or underserved communities with um, plan growth and development so again we provide some very high level considerations and things you might want to think about it's not everything but it's, um, again, just, just wanting to put that on your radar. Um, another thing, too, I'll just make the point with climate change, since this is a water resources element guidance, we're, we were looking through the, um, our updates to the guidance through the lens of, like, how does climate change, um, what, you know, how does climate impact water resources, right? But there's a lot of other climate impacts that we don't even talk about, like heat, you know, urban heat island effects, that's not really, I mean, it can, it can raise the temperature in water bodies as well, but we didn't focus on that a lot, but that's not to say, you know, you don't want to be considering that maybe you're thinking about a broader spectrum of climate change impacts as you update your plan. We were really focused on, you know, how does climate, how's that impacting, you know, extreme weather and precipitation, you know, coastal storms, really the, the water driven climate impacts, flooding, local flooding is where we were mostly focused, but you know, if, if you have the capacity and, you know, if you're, you're seeing, um, I don't know, a lot of emergency room visits or you know you have heat islands or you need cooling centers in certain areas, you know, that, that might be something to think about. So it's, it's really, you can think more broadly than, than what we're um, guiding you to do. Um, yeah, so with that, really, um, we're doing outreach. You know, we, we um, I think I think we first posted, it's been about a year. I guess we, we put the guidance out about it this time last year. Um, 
and you know we're really just now making the rounds doing outreach trying to get the word out you know offer assistance to folks so this this sort of just talks about the trainings and updates we're doing and we want to continue to do and um, we're also working between the agencies to make sure we're reviewing things consistently and, and working together on our reviews and where we reach out and help um, help you with your efforts. And that's really it. Um, we have our contact information. I think at this point, um, we can open up the questions. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was wondering if any of your tools allow for a um, county to come in and utilize the database as a, rep a, a repository at the MDE site or MDP site so that the inputs that you provide for the county for planning are maintained in one place and then it could be a sharing process where the county um, continues to ask for your input and you provide updated analysis which might refresh information. Do you have anything like that available for the communities? Kind of like that. Sort of like a clearinghouse or something. Kind of, yeah. Um, I think the A storm has developed is the MDE reached out to us for, for projects and studies that we were doing. So I think it's, it's being done through the A storm. Yeah, I know as part of A storm, we're really looking at um, one of the requirements of that is to identify frequently flooded areas since like 2000. So maybe that's part of that too that um, the gentleman speaking to, but. I don't know, what were you going to say? Well, there's, there's also this, this tool that the EPA has. Um, they, have, they have this group called the Creating Resilient Water Utilities. And um, this might fit what you're talking about because um, they have a tool um, called CREATE, which is Climate Ready um, Evaluation and Assessment Tool. Mm -hmm. um, and if you, um, if you look up the EPA CREATE, C-R-E-A-T tool, um, you can get an account. And um, you could and basically buy, you get some training about how to use it. Um, and what it does is that it, it basically um, collects the most um, relevant data for climate impacts to your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have basically down to your, your I don't know, I'm not sure how it's just to the county level or region level, but you enter in your locality <coughs> information. Um, it basically downloads the best federal data at least about climate impacts of all types, flooding, um, heat, everything. Um, and you have it in one place and you can save it. You can save different scenarios. And then you can, um, through that tool, you do a climate assessment. Um, you talk to your staff to figure out which of your pieces of infrastructure might be at risk based on their knowledge, you know, about water and sewer infrastructure. You know, we talked to some staff in Baltimore County that did an analysis. They figured out which of their um, sewage pumping stations are at risk of flooding. Um, Washington Sanitary, Suburban Sanitary Commission has done the same thing, looking at flood risks. Um, and, you and so you can start looking at, you know, which facilities are at risk, you create a scenario about that. Um, you start looking at what options you have to protect your, your uh, resource, your infrastructure, whether it's spending money on raising infrastructure or moving it somewhere else. Sometimes you have to move your pumping station somewhere else, for example, or spend money on your stormwater conveyance system so that you have more capacity to deal with more precipitation. But that, that particular tool allows you to enter that information using the best data and information you have, um, either from your local staff or from state staff, and it'll save it. And then the, it also has the federal climate data, best available information, and you, and you save these scenarios and um, it will help you make decisions based on um, an economic cost-benefit analysis. Figure out, based on the likelihood of a risk event happening, it puts a dollar figure on how much money would you save if you acted now versus waiting 20 years to act, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so it's called, it's EPA, and you can look at the Creating Resilient Water Utilities. We have a link in our guidance as well or you can go directly to this tool, which is the, the C-R-E-A-T, it's a create without the E at the end um, tool. So it, it will save all information in one place. Um, I think the gentleman, yes, yes, yes you. <laughs> gotcha. Um, my question is related to the scope of your uh, local assistance visiting us. Uh, we're in the midst of writing our WRE as part of our master plan rewrite. And, and your technical systems. And the, and the question is posed in the sense of, 
we we own our own wastewater treatment plant. We abide by the 80% capacity threshold. Uh, there is likely a projection that we're going to hit that in the out years, certainly within the 10-year frame of the master plan. Um, but we have county uh, analysis that says our current plan is geography limited by any expansion. So in other words, what I'm getting to is we need to take a serious look at where the next wastewater treatment plant facility should be located. So along those lines, your technical assistance, there's a, there's a variety of ways of treating wastewater. Uh, some of them are dependent upon uh, branches of the Pasco for the treated effluent, et cetera, et cetera. Would your assistance help us look at the prime areas within our urban boundary as to where the best places are for us to to say it should go here or it, that facility should be thought about in our improvement plan, capital improvement plan to go here? Yeah, I think we could definitely, um, you know, we'd want to have those kind of proactive discussions and we could, we could help. I think too from a permitting end or you know permitting or you know resource considerations you know maybe give you guidance as to where it might be you know a better area to to, to locate that so yeah certainly happy to, to see where we can help there that's a, that's not something we typically do but I think we want to be you know that that's what we like to be more proactive and upfront in the process so that you know when it comes to getting your permit or what have you you know it's it's, it's a it's a, it's a it's an and, easier process. And as a captain, obvious statement, I mean, we're not experts in that. Right. And so it would be helpful if NDE could right. come in and say, uh, consider these aspects when you talk about locating it. Right. <laughs> Us and, and natural resources, too, because I know, you know, we consult with DNR on, you know, if there's exactly. sensitive resources, things. And so we can bring, you know, probably, you know, multiple agencies to that Thank conversation. You. Yeah. Um, you have to it, sir? Please. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, we have a, a ten-year review period for our comp plans, and um, it seems to me that maybe this water resource element would be something that you should look at a little more frequently than ten years. Um, do you guys have guidance for counties and municipalities as to when it should be looked at? Yeah, I mean, we talk about updating it there, there was a couple slides I, I had towards the end about like when you should update your water resource element um, you know the law like you said the law only says review your plan every two ten years um, but we we do say in our in our checklist there a list of questions we say you know if your water resource element has not yet looked at issues like flooding or climate change um, if you have the resources to begin looking at those issues even if it's to identify the questions that you need answered um, it, it certainly doesn't hurt as part of your review process or if you want to do it more frequently. Um, I know that um, there are notices sometimes of when new TMDLs are identified. I'm not sure if, if similar notices are done to local governments about tier two water buys or high quality waters as they're identified. But those changes happen you know, every so often and um, that might be something that local government may want to take another look at. You know, sometimes you, your land use pattern is pretty much set. You know, your land use plan is pretty much set. Um, but um, new information about climate change and flooding and um, receiving water quality, um, it's really, there's no, there's no harm done in, in looking at that um, whenever that new information arises and thinking, are there more protective measures that we can do under current, even if our land use plan is not changing, under our current um, uh, development requirements, for example, um, to try to, to prevent harm from flooding or to, um, you know, make sure that, um, um, I forgot what the other part I was going to say, but, you know, things of that nature. And I'll, I'll just to add, we um, update our, I mentioned the water quality standards, it all begins with the standards that, you know, are set for your, the particular water body. And we, um, we're supposed to update those every three years. It's a tr called the triennial review. So like if we're gonna, if we identify a new high quality water, um, you know, that we, we, we go through the regulatory process for that, that gets promulgated. Um, and we can, we can do it more frequently, but um, we're supposed to update about every three years. So that gives you a sense of like how often, you know, might MDE be updating water qualities that would maybe bring some new considerations to the water resources element. But, but reach out to us if you have questions about you know current 
issues that are affecting your jurisdiction in terms of receiving waters or, or climate change, we can at least begin to, to answer those questions for you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was curious, when you had that um, flow chart slide up in the upper left-hand corner, there was a box that you said something to the effect of, if standards are unavailable, uh, you can reevaluate. Yeah. And I was wondering what that meant, hoping it would help us with the problem we have with our wastewater plant. Um, basically, if your water quality standard is not, and, and it's going to be like a, a, a science-driven exercise, and also, you know, a, there would be a public process associated with that. You know, if you're if you're going to downgrade, if if essentially there's a process by which, if you if you say, you know, the standard set for this water body is just it's completely unobtainable, whether that's um, technically or from a cost, you know, um, a cost perspective. Um, there's a process by which you can go through to sort of downgrade that. Like I said, we've never really done that in Maryland. Does that work with the wastewater plant as well? Um, probably, I mean, it did, uh, we'd have to talk more about that. I mean, because um, I'm not really sure exactly what you mean. <laughs> okay. About 15 years ago, we upgraded our plant with yeah. MDE from an eight and a half to a 10 million gallon per day plant. Okay. And our last two comprehensive plans have assumed we are a 10 MGE plant. I was told recently by a utilities director that that approval by MDE was caveated on as long as you can treat the byproduct to a certain degree. And she tells me there is no science to meet that standard. So we are stuck at eight and a half. And we are getting close to mm -hmm. uh, not being able to approve more growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to have a conversation about that. It seems like with wastewater, you know, there's all, often, um, you know, technology based, the best available technology. Um, so if you're, if you can demonstrate you're sort of at the best level of technology that's achievable, we can base our water quality standards on the best available technology. Um, but you know, as to like you know what that means for your receiving waters, um, you know, it's a broader conversation. Um, so yeah, we can talk offline about that. Uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but one thing I should have said in the. Um, yeah. I guess we're getting pretty to 12 if I have no more questions. Getting pretty close. Were there any more, any other questions? That's yes, ma'am. Hi, Mark. I want to go back to the municipalities and the state who do have flooding problems. Mm -hmm. um, but thankfully, we do not. So does that just need to be acknowledged then, you know, in our um, water resource element that you know, we don't have flooding issues, so we don't need to address them? Yeah, I think just speaking to it, right, some acknowledgement of that and kind of like the what, what your vulnerabilities are and based upon those vulnerabilities, you know, how does that influence, you know, your local plan development. I think that's, yeah, yeah, I think that's appropriate. In some cases, you're not going to be having some of the challenges we're talking about. But we just don't want to see, like, the plan silent, like, no acknowledgement of, you know, if you just didn't acknowledge, I, I think that would be... You know, a real missed opportunity for sure, and not consistent with the guidance. Uh, more of a comment than a um, question. The gentleman at the end of this little table here had asked about guidance on the um, updating for the WREs. Um, I um, was under the understanding that the county water and sewer plan was required to be updated or at least reviewed every three years. Maybe that's in co in coincides with the MDE three year every three year requirement you're talking about, but that the um, county water, I'm sorry, the comprehensive water and sewer plan from the county is required every three years to be updated. Wouldn't that be appropriate guidance? Well, that's in, in terms of like when the water resource element should also be updated or? Well, I mean, isn't there quite a bit of overlap between the two? Um, well, it's just slightly different in that the, um, when you're doing your water resource element, you're kind of looking ahead you know, you, let's say if you were starting from scratch and you did a, a land use plan map that, you know, you have your land use plan map here, um, you basically look ahead and say, well, how much water and sewer are we going to need based on our land use plan? Um, and sometimes you're going to have to come up with brand new ideas for expanding your capacity um, based on that analysis of your land use plan's needs. Yes. The water and sewer plan then um, kind of looks backwards. It says, well, based on what the water resource element said and your land use plan said, here's what we need to do on the water and sewer side in order to succeed with the land use plan. So there, there is definitely some overlap because sometimes the vision seen in the water resource element will ultimately show up in the water and sewer plan. And sometimes 
visions that are in the water and sewer plan for, for meeting various needs um, subsequently may need to, be, need to be emphasized back into the comp plan. So there is some overlap. Yeah, does that, does that help? It is, there is a subtle difference. We probably should we probably should break because it's new. Yeah, it's it's new. Uh, but we're we're here. We, yeah, we're here for uh, if you have any other questions and um, we have a card thing somewhere too. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.